I think we should get going. So um, we are recording, so that's all good. Um, and hello and good evening to everybody. Thank you. I love my twinkly lights as well. They um, they make me feel they make me feel happy. Quite frankly, having sparkly sparkly lights in my shed quarters. Um, my name is Claire Ackers. I am the chair of the wonderful, inimitable Lean In Leads. Um, this is our March event, and it is our celebration of. Um, International Women's Day. Now, we decided to do it on Thursday for a couple of reasons. One, because there are so many other um, International Women's Day events going on and we didn't want to have to compete for your time or for you to have to choose which event to go to. Also, because Monday we figured a lot of people would be a bit overwhelmed with kids going back to school, perhaps, and it might not be the best evening. And also because we thought Thursday might be a better night for a bit of a celebration. Um, I don't drink myself, but, you know, feel free to have a glass of wine yeah Steph's got a glass of white there um Thursday's nearly the weekend so we are looking forward to a really really good celebration this evening now here's the moment of truth does the presentation work way right hopefully you can all see the next slide so International Women's Day I'm just going to minimize this a little bit so I can actually see what I'm talking about sorry bear with me two seconds Yes, so International Women's Day. Um, the global theme of International Women's Day, as I am sure you're aware, is choose to challenge. And at Lean and Lead, we decided we wanted to put a spin on this, uh, which is basically, is it time to stop asking for permission? So just a couple of housekeeping things before we get straight into it. Uh, we are recording this event. <laughs> Um, so if you could put yourself on mute, that would be absolutely marvellous. But if you could leave your camera on, it would be great, because quite frankly, on this side of the screen, it's really hard not to be able to see anybody's faces. Um, but if you can leave your camera on one, that would be marvellous. But please be aware that you are being you are being recorded, um, mainly to share with our other members um, who can't make it this evening. We like to circulate recording. And I should also mention as well that our Zoom account is a um, is provided by Lean In HQ. So Cheryl Sandberg could potentially log on and, and watch this event. Um, so um, yeah, just to make you aware of that, basically. Um, so we have designed a bit of a journey for this evening. So I just want to take you through the agenda. Um, we're going to start with a high energy celebration, and we're going to end nice and mellow. So I'll just take you through um what we are gonna do this evening so with the theme i give myself permission to so the first section is have fun laugh and celebrate and we have managed to secure the services of the lovely steph otty who is a broadcaster journalist and founder who is going to tell us about her story and hopefully inspire some people then the uh the second section is live life on my terms and be all that i am i give myself permission to do that um and you get me doing that with my other hat on as a authenticity and mindset business coach and then section three we have our fantastic diversity and inclusion team so sarah keithley alicia as is and mark edison uh they are our lean and leads dni team and they're going to be talking about challenging the status quo which is absolutely fantastic um and then i have my fantastic co-chair joe penkett um talking about i give myself permission to ask for help um and she's going to be joined by mental health recruitment specialist javid bobat Section five is over to you and we're going to be talking about collaborating and lifting each other up. We want to hear your stories and that is going to be facilitated by uh, a new member of the steering committee, Claire Ramsey. Um, and then we are going to finish by tape, giving myself permission to take time out and harness positivity. And we have got the amazing Nikki Green, who is a founder of the yoga space and a yoga teacher who is going to be finishing with a beautiful uh, yoga meditation. So we finish feeling all blissed out and absolutely lovely um you definitely are going to want a drink for this uh you may want to grab a pen and paper especially for my bit um and please share your stories your thoughts your questions and your comments throughout in the chat we really really do want to hear from you and make this as interactive and, and valuable as possible basically um so you may have spotted oh sorry um Yes, before we get onto that bit, I just want to mention Lean and Leads, what we're all about. There are definitely some new faces here tonight. So I just want to touch on Lean and Leads, what we're all about and what we're here to do. We have a mission, which is to, to lift each other up. 
Um, and our vision is to advocate for women and others who don't automatically receive equal opportunities, especially during the pandemic. We know it is tough at the moment. Um, our vision is to elevate the structure, functions and processes of Lean and Leads to support our community. I think we're up to 835 members, which is absolutely phenomenal. Um, we want to be part of the community. We want to be supportive and we want to make sure that we're representing. Um, and then our third part of the vision is to align with the Lean In global strategy. We are part of a global organisation. I think there's 59,000 circles globally. Um, so it's no small part to be part of Lean In Leads. Um, we've got some specific objectives this year, which we are hoping that, that you are going to help us achieve, which are to increase our presence in the Leeds, Yorkshire, UK and global community and be recognised as a force for change, to serve our community, reaching new people, links with schools, etc., having roundtables with other groups and promoting gender equality at policy level um, and to challenge each other to grow, level up and lean in. If you are just joining us, welcome. Could you make, please make sure you've got yourself on mute? Thank you so much. Um, and there's our values there as well. So our meetings run smoothly. We do have a code of conduct that we ask people to, to just bear in mind when they're here, which is commitment. Everyone should be invested in our circle success and be fully present in meetings. You've made the effort to be here. So, you know, let's engage and enjoy it. Uh, communication, commit to sharing openly and honestly and listening with empathy um, and confidentiality. Trust is critical. What happens in our circle should stay in our circle. Hopefully that all makes sense. And we have a special International Women's Day campaign running. I don't know if you've seen it on our social media, um, but we would love it if you posted and tweeted throughout the evening using the hashtags, uh, hashtag Lean and Leads and hashtag Choose to Challenge. And here are some of our um, steering committee, you can see us here writing down what they choose to challenge. Now, in order to make this happen, we've tried to make it as easy as possible. So the lovely Orla will be dropping some links into the chat here. Um, if she's listening and about to drop it in. Hey, it works. Fantastic. Thanks, Orla. Um, if you click that link there, that will take you to Canva. Hopefully, at least some of you are familiar with Canva and how it works. And there are a couple of templates there um, for you to fill in yourself of what you give yourself permission to do. So the one on the right hand side here is to put a photo of yourself in. Um, and the one on the left here is to, to put some text in. Um, these are sized for, uh, for Facebook and LinkedIn posts. But if you're savvy with Canva, you can just do a little resize and do it for an Instagram story, an Instagram post. Um, don't forget to tag us. And we would love to see what you come up with with this. Uh, so have fun and enjoy it. Um, so I think without further ado, that it is now time to hand over to Steph Otty to tell her story. Steph, over to you. Great stuff. Thank you. Um, just first of all, thank you very much for asking me to be part of tonight's event. Uh, it would, of course, have been lovely to be able to do this in person, as I'm sure I'm not the only one who's becoming a little bit zoomed out of late. Uh, it does have its upsides. It means that while I may look vaguely presentable from the waist up, I'm actually able to see the pajamas at the moment, so uh, uh, it's, uh, it's, it has its bonuses. Um, so I just wanted to start off really by giving you a bit of a, a background on me and, and my journey really. So in true newsreader style, uh, here are the headlines. Breaking news, you'll never get rich being a local journalist. Former Pulse reporter lifts the lid on low salaries and smelly basement offices. Jobs for the boys, what life was really like as a producer for Sky Sports. A leap of faith, how the prospect of leaving Yorkshire inspired a new business venture. And two fingers up to the doubters, to those who said it had only last six months. Here we are six years later. So first tonight, my first full-time gig in radio. Um, it was at the Pulse of West Yorkshire in Bradford and it always used to make me laugh the misconceptions of jobs in radio because you do become known in the area because you're broadcasting to so many people and there's almost a hero worship aspect like you're a, a local celebrity and I think one of the biggest misconceptions of them all is that you must get paid a fortune. Well I can tell you now being a local radio journalist you really don't. Um, I mean the ship salary was 
shockingly low. Um, but I can honestly say that I loved that job. There was not a single day that I didn't enjoy going to work. Um, and for that, I felt truly, truly blessed because while friends around me may have been earning three times more than I was, every Sunday it'd be them that would be dreading heading back to work on Monday. And I couldn't wait to get in. I, I was doing a job that I'd always wanted to do. I was working alongside some incredible people, um, meeting incredible people. Um, some of the people that I got to interview during my time there, um, the likes of Tony Blair, Gordon Brown, Sir Patrick Stewart, um, celebrities. Um, but it wasn't all quite as glam as it seemed because um, as well as the poor pay, the news team were actually based um, in an underground office that was actually built among Bradford's old canal system. So in the summer, when it, when it got a little bit too warm, it also became a little bit pongy <laughs> and the stench of sewage was uh, almost unbearable at times. Um, I mean, I say almost because I managed to stick it out for seven wonderful years. I met some amazing people. I made friends for life. And shortly after I left, they then relocated to a brand new state of the art shiny building, uh, which by all accounts smelt much fresher than the, the newsroom that we'd left behind. Well, next, the dream job or a baptism of fire, because in 2010, I landed my dream job as a producer for Sky Sports. And while once again, I met a lot of fantastic people there, my business partner, Jamie, being one of them, I also had to deal with sexism and bullying from one colleague in particular. Um, it was a very male dominated industry and he refused to believe that as a woman, I was in any way qualified to be a producer at Sky Sports. Um, little did he know that I'd actually been raised with two sports mad brothers. And I think for my mom and dad, it was easier because they already had two boys. I used to get bundled into the car and sent alongside to the to all the different sporting events, to, all, to the cricket matches, to the rugby matches, to the football matches. So I managed to become a bit of a sports nut myself and soaked up all this knowledge of my brothers and, and just from going to these events myself. Um, what's more, during the many years that I had at the Pulse radio station as well, with West Yorkshire being a, a hardcore rugby league territory, I'd also totally fallen in love with rugby league, um, not just the guys that play it, although um, that, I can't lie, so, you know, <laughs> it's always a bonus, um, but I'd developed a really, really big passion for the sport. Um, so armed with this knowledge, I was more than capable of holding my own in what was a predominantly man's world of sports journalism. And I was proud to be able to prove myself and not only prove myself, to really excel at Sky and anyone who may have doubted me in the beginning certainly didn't by the time that I left. Now, the capital is calling or maybe Steph, yeah. sorry, I'm so sorry to jump in and interrupt your flow, but we are having a teeny tiny trouble with the sound. Oh, okay. um, can you try turning yourself up a little bit, please? Let's have a little look, yeah. Yeah. Sorry, I'm really sorry to it's interrupt okay. your flow there. Don't worry, it's fine. Uh, let me see my Zoom settings. Here we go. Either that or just yell at us. <laughs> just yell. Maybe I need to get nearer <laughs> to my computer. Um, can you hear me now as I'm speaking? Am I any louder? Can we have thumbs up from the audience? Can anyone hear? Yeah, that seems to be better. Sorry, better? crack on. Yeah. <laughs> okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna lean in. I think it's because I wasn't close enough to the mic, so I'll just uh very apt. In. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so um, so yeah, so while I was at Sky, um, the department in which I worked for um, was based in Leeds, which it couldn't have been more perfect really because I'm a Yorkshire girl and I never really had that desire to go and live and work in London. It just didn't appeal to me. Um, but four years into the job, we were told that that department would actually be shut down. And so we were encouraged to apply for alternative positions within Sky Sports, but all of those were based down in London at their Osterley headquarters. Um, the alternative we had was to take redundancy. Um, and that would obviously mean waving goodbye to what was then a generous salary, private healthcare, uh, free Sky TV, 
um, you know, it, it was it was a good place to work. They did look after their staff. Um, so neither were really appealing options. Uh, so to say, you know, that I had many sleepless nights at that time would be an understatement. Um, and it was at that point that myself and Jamie, who I worked alongside at Sky, began talking about the possibility of going it alone um, and about doing something together to make use of our industry experience. So we hatched a plan to take the redundancy and a huge leap of faith and develop a news bulletin service. So have we made a mistake was probably the most used phrase of 2015. Radio News Hub was born out of a desire to provide all radio stations, no matter how big or how small, with an affordable quality news service, which could enhance their output. Um, we targeted English speaking stations, not only in the UK, but around the world as well. And having worked as a journalist, the actual news side of things to us uh, came quite easy. You know, that was the simple part. We, we knew news, we, we knew radio. Um, so that bit we got. So we launched with just six client radio stations. Um, from a basement office in Huddersfield. It was the only thing we could afford. Um, the location was terrible. Uh, we actually picked it because we did this thing of looking on a map and figured that it was equidistant from where Jamie and I both lived. Um, but it turned out that it proved to be possibly the most difficult place on earth to get to. It just seemed to be one of these places where there was no quick route in or out. Um, as well as that, we had our neighboring businesses that were just so loud and because we were obviously in the, the business of recording bulletins that didn't exactly uh, bode well for us um, on market days uh, down there you'd have cars and vans that would literally park up uh, bang outside the office it would block any natural light that we did have and it would also completely cut off our tv aerial so we were unable to monitor the news channels it would interfere with our broadband connection so all in all, it was um, it was a bit of a disaster, um, but we stuck it out there for a little while and we managed to blag ourselves some advertising by way of an article in Radio Today, which is the industry magazine. Um, and while people wished us luck to our face, and I'm sure some people were genuine, the knives were certainly out on social media pages and online forums. And most people gave us six months tops. And some of the comments that we read at that time were really hurtful and they were demoralizing. And part of us believed that they could be right. You know, we looked at it and we thought, we're sat here in a basement office with six client stations. And, um, you know, we thought, could they be right? Is this a total waste of time? Um, but a bigger part of us really wanted to prove that actually they were wrong and we could make a success of this. So the business itself was entirely self-funded. Um, Jamie and I were freelancing full-time at other radio stations in order to not only pay our personal bills, but also invest in Radio News Hub. So I, for example, would work a breakfast shift. I was doing shifts at Radio Air, um, Yorkshire Radio, Stray FM in Harrogate, Hearts in Global. And then I'd head over to Huddersfield to read the drive bulletins for the business. And Jamie would be doing the opposite. So he would be picking up breakfast bulletins for the business and then he'd shoot off and pick up a shift elsewhere. And of course, with news, it's 24 seven. So there's no let up, there's no weekends, there's no time off, it was constant. So we did this constantly. Um, and on top of that, we were also working to of course, attract more radio stations and grow our client base. Um, we knew that the hours that we were putting in weren't sustainable long term, but I think we really believed in the business and we really believed in the idea of, of Radio News Hub. And it was just about having the will to execute it and trying to put that exhaustion to the side, really. So we knew that we needed to do more to monetize the business. And the initial concept that we came up with was to follow each one of our news bulletins that we produced with a 30 second commercial. Um, we'd sell that to advertisers and that revenue would in turn help with the business. But up to this point, uh, we hadn't sold any. 
and we didn't have any idea where to start. We were journalists. We'd never been salespeople. That wasn't our forte. So basically, armed with a stack of newspapers, we began trawling the classified sections. Um, we were too scared to pick up the phone and actually have real conversations because we didn't want them to ask us questions that we couldn't answer. So instead, we just fired off emails to every company we came across. I mean, literally hundreds and hundreds of companies. And eventually, we had a breakthrough. And we had a contact from a TV aerial firm who had said that they wanted to give radio advertising a try. So we pretty much invented a rate card on the spot. Um, we had no clue what we were supposed to charge. Uh, but judging by how quickly they accepted it, I'm guessing we massively undersold it at the time. But it was a sale and we'd secured our first advertiser. And while it wasn't going to bring in enough cash for Jamie and I to all of a sudden quit the other jobs, it did give us hope and a renewed belief that actually we could be really onto something here. So I'll be honest, the next two to three years of Radio News Hub are a bit of a blur. Uh, we attended every trade show going. We went to hospital radio conventions, community radio awards all around the UK. We traveled up and down the country meeting with station owners. Um, and then we started going through to Europe to meet with expat stations, all in a bid to, to spread the word globally. And there was a phrase I heard not so long ago that really rang true with me. And that was that success usually comes to those who are too busy to be looking for it. Well, we were certainly busy. <laughs> in just a few years, we'd launched a new business and grown our number of client radio stations from just six to more than 150. Our very first advertising client that we'd convinced to sign up in the early days was still with us, but they'd been joined by others, including our most high profile at the time, which was Jet2 Airlines, which for us was a real coup. We'd also moved to a new office building, so we were no longer in Huddersfield. We'd moved to an office in Leeds, and we'd had not one but two studios built to accommodate the growing number of services that we were now offering. Um, we began providing bespoke bulletin services as well to a large commercial radio group called Nation Broadcasting, which really was a game changer for us. And I think at that point, that's possibly when people started taking us seriously. Jamie and I were finally able to quit freelancing, so we were then able to work solely on building the business. It was shortly after that that I rather unexpectedly fell pregnant, and the business was at such a pivotal point that, I'll be honest, I was really worried about what that might mean. And as my pregnancy went on and I started attending some aquanatal classes and I'd listened to the other moms talking about their planned maternity leave. And I just remember thinking, I can't do that. I, I, you know, I, can't, I can't just down tools because the business has come too far and I can't, I can't stop. So I did carry on and I worked until a couple of days before my due date. Um, by which time my bump was so large, I was struggling to get anywhere near the faders. So I was probably <laughs> wasn't any good at work anyway. Um, Sullivan, our not so little boy, came into the world on the 13th of September 2018, uh, weighing a colossal 10 pound, two ounces. Um, he was a big boy. Um, so that was the September. And by the December, I was back working full time. And I'll be honest, I felt guilty. Um, you know, I felt I felt I was a bad mum. Um, because I was having to put him in nursery and put in the business first. But I also felt a real determination um, to continue building the business for not only to me to be proud of that, but that hopefully someday my son will one day be really proud of what his mum has achieved. So let's fast forward to present day because I'm conscious of time um, to say the last year has been a challenge would be something of an understatement um, I like many embrace lockdown one the sun was shining my other half was furloughed so childcare was no issue and I was loving working from home getting the chance to spend time with my boys walk the dog drink far too much wine um, but as Covid intensified it did see us lose business we lost commercial revenue and changes within the industry led to some of our biggest clients being sold to Bauer and Global, meaning they no longer required our services. Lockdown two and three did bring further battles on a personal level, 
with my other half back at work, my parents shielding and my son's nursery shutting down. So it meant that I found myself working from home with a little boy who's just hit the terrible twos. Um, just a couple of weeks ago, while I was engrossed in yet another Zoom call in his frustration at being ignored by mummy, uh, my toddler decided to launch a toy at the TV and totally shattered the screen. So it's fair to say on days like that, that I did sit there and think, I don't think I can do this anymore. Um, but we do, and we get up and we, and we carry on. And, you know, I'm, I'm pleased to say that on the business side of things, Radio News Hub now broadcasts to more than 300 radio stations around the world. And since launch, we've dispatched almost 9 million bulletins. Um, we yet again have moved to a standalone office this time with state-of-the-art studios, and our turnover is continuing to grow year on year. And during a pandemic that has seen so many people lose their jobs, in the last six months, we've actually created seven full-time positions. So it's not bad for a business that most people gave six months. And I give myself permission to celebrate that. Thank you for your time. Oh, Steph, that was absolutely inspiring. Thank you so much. And as somebody who has also been pregnant and went back to work after four weeks, I remember sitting there breastfeeding the baby in one hand, client calls on the other. It, th there's nothing quite like it, is there, for the, for the multitasking. No. <laughs> uh, I know you have to go and do bedtime, but have you got time just for a couple of questions while we've got you? Because a couple come in. Yeah. Um, so we have got... Um, how did you manage to stay upbeat on air? I think that was when you were telling the very start where you're getting all the knockbacks and all the rest of it. And then sort of similar, Gillian saying, how did you keep believing in your vision and yourself despite all the knockbacks? Absolutely love this story. I'm tired just hearing how hard Steph worked. <laughs> uh, I think a lot of it was just um, pig-headedness and wanting to prove people wrong. Um, you know, um, seeing some of the comments that we saw when we first started the business and knowing how hard we were working. I mean, as I said, you know, we were working two jobs. We were exhausted. We were putting everything into that business. And we did know what we were doing. You know, we'd had a lot of years in the industry. And, you know, so we, I think the main thing it, it came down to was just having that belief that what we were doing was worthwhile. And even though there were a lot of doubters, the, what, the people that did back us, I just chose to believe them. and ignore the people that doubted us and like I say I, I, I wanted to prove them wrong you know I, I love the fact that I can still turn around to these people that gave us six months and say well six years later here we are and actually we're doing a bloody good job so <laughs> you know and and that I think more than anything I think that's just it you know yeah I was exhausted I was really exhausted but um, I really believed in what we were doing and I think that's the key really yeah absolutely oh thank you for coming on and telling your story you have set a beautiful tone for the evening um if you can stay brilliant if you need to go then thank you very much and let's hope to see you at a face-to-face -face meeting soon yes definitely <laughs> all right thanks so much cheers sir thank you <laughs> okay right um on to the next segment which is, is me. <laughs> so hello again. Um, I am Claire Ackers. Hopefully my sound's okay. Can you just give me a thumbs up if you can hear me? Okay. The sound looks okay. Fantastic. Right. Give me a sec. Sorry. So as well as being chair of the incredible Lean and Lead, my day job is as an authenticity and um, leadership coach. And I work with values led leaders of fast growth businesses um, who want not only to have incredible financial success, but who also want to level up and positively impact the world. So I was walking in the woods last week with my husband and he asked me a question that absolutely blew my world apart um and I want to share this little story with you because it perfectly illustrates how easy it is to take away your own permission to live life on your terms um, and be your own authentic self and it totally called me out and I had a moment of complete peace and clarity um followed by pure panic because um I knew it meant making some scary changes 
Um, so we continued our walk through the woods, through Carverley Woods, if anyone knows that part of the world. Um, then we went and got a Starbucks drive through and then we went and got ice cream uh, because we managed to ditch the kids for a bit. Um, and I felt the fizzing, I felt the excitement, and I just knew I was on the, 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 the verge, on the beginning of something absolutely brilliant. Um, because you see, I had just been through a really, really rough month or two. I didn't share it with many people, but I felt completely lost. Nothing was working. I felt like I was wading through treacle. Um, and I felt really demotivated and rubbish and small and like I had zero idea what I was doing. Um, and I have been the director of a my own company for the past six years and what I would consider to be a pretty successful entrepreneur. Um, and I'd been working really, really hard to create a program that just was not working. Um, I was trying to market it to a specific niche, you see, and it was totally crap to be perfectly honest. Um, and I just wasn't passionate enough about this sector. And I was playing small and I was playing safe. And ironically, the number one thing I work with people on is their authenticity, knowing who they are and what they stand for, and then having the courage to live that every day. And I was resisting it so, so hard. I built this little this little box of myself um, and I was feeling totally, totally trapped and like I'd committed to a certain path. And I know there's some people here who work with me and know exactly what I'm talking about here. I'm telling them all the same things that, oh, that I, I need to tell myself. And I was trying desperately to prove myself for reasons um, that we don't have time to go into today, but I was basically trying to prove myself and be a people pleaser and all that good stuff. Um, and this box, this box I was trapped in, it was a lovely box, but it wasn't my box. Um, and I was resisting opening this particular box, getting the key and opening this particular box because it meant making some really scary changes. But I was living at about 20% of my capacity. And this is the number one thing that I want to talk to you about uh, today, inviting you, you to look at yourself uh, and where you are playing small at the moment. Um, how you are doing yourself a disservice and where you could be being more authentic and living life on your terms. And the quote you see in front of you, you can do hard things, is by Glennon Doyle, who wrote Untamed. And if you haven't read that, I suggest you do it so immediately because it's absolutely brilliant. Um, but yes, you can do hard things. And I get that life is really, really tough at the moment. For many of us, we are the shock absorber situation. Have you heard that, that phrase, the shock absorber? Um, we have caring responsibilities for parents, whether those are physical or emotional, uh, as well as being in the thick of it with kids or trying to juggle our own careers um, and, and, and perform that and, and keep things going with a partner or whatever. And this lockdown, I don't know about you, but it has been particularly tough. I've got three kids. They are all at very different ages and, and, and stages and needs, an 11 year old, a six year old and an 18 month old. So juggling their needs has been a blooming nightmare, quite frankly. Um, and I am, hold my hands up, I am an absolutely terrible teacher. Um, my husband and I are both business owners and I literally skipped down the road on Monday when we dropped them off at school. Um, it was like a, like a massive release. So I am not saying it's easy to step outside your comfort zone and be all that you can be, but that it is so, so worth it. And as Glennon says, you can do hard things. And I believe we are at a point, a pivotal point in our history where we have an opportunity um, and the world needs people like you. To, who believe in gender equality, who believe in positive impact and who believe in collaborating to make those changes. And we need you to step up and be brave and be visible. And I want you to know that I believe in you and I believe in your limitless potential. So the second point is what are you resisting? This is my question and my challenge to you. Is it overwhelm? Is it imposter syndrome? Is it not having an idea where to start? Is it fear of being uh, 
um, being seen as selfish if you put your own needs first at the moment, especially when so many people are suffering at the moment. Um, and in fact, let me speak to that because it is a biggie. It's a really, really common one that people don't want to put their own needs first because they, they fear being seen as selfish. Um, the dinosaurs have had plenty of opportunity to mess up the world societally economically politically whatever it is i kind of think they've had their turn um what we need are people like you to trailblaze it's not selfish to live life on your terms it's honest and it is authentic and it is good and it is important and authenticity leads to real conversations which leads to real impact which leads to beautiful vision which leads to values-led companies and i think that has a, a positive ripple effect so what are you resisting is it being vulnerable is it being visible is it making scary changes that may impact your life whether positively or negatively or both is it not knowing where to start you start by giving yourself permission to be honest, to be authentic and to be all you can be. So here is how, or the first step in how to live an authentic life on your terms. So I hope you've all got a piece of paper or you can watch this back and get a piece of paper and a pen. And what I would like you to do is big line down the middle. And on the left hand side, write how I have been showing up up until now. And then on the right hand side, how I will show up from now. For example, on the left hand side, it may have things like I'm worried about what people might think of me. I feel a bit nervous. I feel hesitant to speak up. I have a physical reaction to showing up, whether that's sweaty palms, uh, nervous wheeze, being conscious of my appearance, um, being desperate to to impact or persuade or, or, or prove that I'm worth something. Um, I'm, I'm aware of a little voice in my head telling me I'm not good enough or who the hell am I to speak out or put myself forward. So on the left hand side, you're writing down how I've been showing up up until now. And then on the right hand side, how you are going to show up from now on, how you commit to showing up from now on, committed to speaking my truth, to trusting I will be heard, to knowing my opinion is important, to trusting I will connect with the people who need to hear it, uh, to be strong in my values and my vision and to be free to be exactly who I am. So hopefully that makes sense and you've got some ideas and I have a little challenge for you, a little invitation, which is to commit to being 10% braver. My challenge to you, lovely, lovely people here tonight, is where you can be 10% braver. Where can you speak out, do something you've been putting off, uh, commit to something that makes you want to puke? Um, I would love you to send me a message, let me know what it is, put it in the chat box and we can have a little chat about it later and we can support you and um, acknowledge that you are committing to do that or just know it for yourself that you were going to go away from here and commit to being 10% braver um, and to live life authentically and live life on your terms. Please give yourself permission because you are absolutely fantastic. Um, that's the end of my bit. I am now going to pass you on to our wonderful diversity and inclusion team to talk about giving yourself permission to challenge the status quo. Thank you very much. Hey everyone. Do we have Mark? I'm here. Hiya. Um, so I think you're starting. <laughs> well, I might start. Sorry, I'm just sat there quietly waiting. But, uh, hi everyone, I'm Mark. For those of you who've not met me, I'm the DNI lead 
for leaning in my day-to-day -day job. I'm actually well, technically a recruitment manager for Hermes. I usually have like a big neon background, but um, it's now gone. So there you go. Um, over to you. Uh, yeah, I'm Zara Heathley. I am also on the DNI stream at Lean In and Pensions Consultant in my day job. And I am Alicia. I'm also part of the DNI steering group as well. And my day job is a management consultant for um, a consultancy firm in Leeds. Over to you, Mark. Thank you. So you'll have spotted on the screen. We've got some, um, you know, you can't tell we've not been practicing this. Week. Um, we've got some acronyms on the screen and I just want you to have a think about what they might mean to pop it in the chat. Get my chat open, see if anything's coming through. I'm quite intrigued to see what anybody actually, what anybody can um, decipher what it is. <laughs> um. <laughs> this is where I forget what they are. <laughs> No, they're, they're not the nine things to do with DNI. Yeah, I You might have stumped people, aren't I? <laughs> it, I think we have. I, mean... I, think we went, I think we shot people <laughs> by here, didn't we? So, the top one is, that's the way we have always done it. Oh, Catherine got in there just as I said it. <laughs> <laughs> and then the other one is, but that's the way we've always done it. How many times have you heard those sayings, either at work or in your personal life? It's just, well, that's the way we've always done it. We've always done it this way, so why change? And actually, the second you start asking why and going, well, why do we do it that way? Why, why, why? Is when you really start to unpick some of the kind of structures that's been built around things. And that's what we're going to talk about today. Can I have the next slide, please? I don't know who's controlling. Excellent, thank you. So I'm just going to tell a little story to, to demonstrate this. Um, so some friends are cooking a big dinner and it's for a special occasion. And one of the dishes is a big joint of beef. Uh, and one friend is preparing the beef. Uh, and just after putting it in the roasting tin, uh, they take a knife and they cut off both ends of the joint of beef and then they put it in the tin and they put it in the oven. Uh, there's two friends in the kitchen and the other friend says, what are you doing? Um, and the friend says, oh, I'm just cutting the ends off, you know, that's what I always do when I do a roast. And the friend asks, but why? <laughs> I've never done that. Uh, and the friend says, I don't know actually, my dad taught me how to do a roast and this is just the way he taught me. I don't know, I guess I just didn't, it makes it taste better. And the friend says, all right, whatever. And they carry on making dinner. And then the first friend is kind of curious about this and sort of brings it up later on that night, tell her, tell her about the dinner and asks, what's the reason for cutting off the ends of the beef? Uh, and dad says, yeah, it, it makes it juicier or, or something. Um, I don't know, actually, that's just the way my mum taught me uh, and I just carried it on. Uh, and the daughter says, well, OK, fair enough. It must be right if, if Grand does it. I mean, her roast is legendary and, and they carry on chatting. Uh, and then Dad gets curious about this and decides to, to ring, ring Grant and ask her the origins of this secret family recipe for roast beef that involves cutting off the ends of the beef. And uh, so he rings Grant and says, yeah, when you used to make roast beef when I was a kid and you always cut the ends off it, what, what does that do? Like, does it make it cook faster or something? Uh, does it make it juicier? Uh, and Grant says, oh, sweetheart, that, my roasting tin was just too small for... The joint and I never got around to buying a bigger one and just had to cut the ends off so that it would fit. <laughs> so it's just a silly story. You might have heard something, a variation of that before, put your hand up if, you, if you've seen, heard something like that before. It's just a nice way of demonstrating that I think. But I think what I really like about that story is it um, it does really show, as Mark was saying, the, the power of just asking that, that simple question, why? So why do we do it this way? And that, that sparks a whole chain of events in which the history was, was revealed. Um, I was talking to my mum the other night about uh, about my nephew, her grandson, who's four, 
uh, and she was saying to me, oh yeah, his favourite word at the moment is why, he's just constantly asking why. <laughs> and we both agreed that this was a great thing and should be encouraged, even if it was kind of annoying. Um, but I think what, what we just wanted to talk about today is, is that is the one way of disrupting maybe the status quo, is just asking that, that, that tiny, powerful question, why? Uh, and so Alicia is going to know how to do a little bit more about it. Thanks so much, Sarah. So on, on the theme of asking for why, and with Mark on the call, this was actually inspired through his experiences. So um, probably won't, I probably won't do it justice if we can just move to the next slide. Um, it will just start sort of unpicking this notion of asking why and this idea of um, seeking permission to um, challenge the status quo. So just out of curiosity, and I would love it if you guys could, um, if anyone can actually use a chat, but have you heard the term, you aren't the right culture fit, or in fact, you are the right culture fit? Has that ever happened to you? Is it something that you've even said um, to colleagues or to candidates if you're, in the, if you're inside of the recruiter? So, so Claire's mentioned right fit for sure. Yeah. And... Okay, so we've got Catherine who said after an interview as a reason to not hire me. And I guess Catherine and, and to those who are thinking of this, of this sort of notion of not being the culture fit, I guess it's asking yourself, how did it make you feel? And what did it do for you? Did you, and for those that actually have hired someone because that you felt they had made the, they were the right culture fit for the organization, which is also okay. Let's just, you know, be comfortable with the notion for the time being. Did it actually do anything different for you in your organization? And if so, what was it? Okay, so Catherine's also talking. Sorry, I'm also looking partly at the chat. Um, made me think that, that they weren't the right culture fit for me too. Well, interestingly, what's quite, and, I, and I'd love the conversation. I think Sarah and Mark will continue sort of looking in the chat box to see what's going on. What's really interesting around this quote is by using the notion you aren't the right culture fit is you've very or pretty much re restricted your choice of attracting yourself to um, individuals that don't really appeal to your sort of like minded sort of values and opinions and, and perspectives. What it actually what it does um, by you choosing somebody who has that right culture fit is that you're not offering a chance for innovation or for seeking creative answers or for challenging um, the views of others. So what I mean by this, if I feel like I'm going around in circles, apologies, we've not I've not rehearsed this before. So it's a little bit um, nerving. So I'm giving myself permission to just accept that it's OK. Um, I think what I'm trying to say is by you hiring, by you seeking roles that are, you know, the right culture fit or seeking roles that don't seem to give you the, like, attract you because it seems like the right culture fit or attracting candidates that happen to be the right culture fit isn't the right way to go. Only because it's actually seeking individuals that don't have the same values, views and perspectives of your, of your own, who think with, a, who go with a different lens and um, navigate the world with a different lens are those individuals that can bring something quite disruptive and innovative into your organization or into your own um, sort of team environments or your own sort of even your own personal life. So I think what will be quite nice for us going forward is take giving yourself permission to sort of address that culture fit and not being afraid to go against it and actually reaching out to individuals or to teammates and colleagues that are different to you, be in a different department to gauge their thoughts and their opinions of how to deal with certain problems and challenges because there is a greater chance that in doing so, you're able to seek a different solution and a new opportunity. And that's where newer organizations and organizations that recognize seeking those with the right culture fit isn't the way forward. And in fact, looking at and looking at a culture ad or looking at those individuals that can add to their organizational culture is what they're thriving, tr striving and thriving as a result of that. So now organizations are seeking more and more individuals. And I think more individuals are being attracted to organizations where they can disrupt it, where they can ask the challenging questions, where they can poke holes in certain things and in lots of things actually. And because of that, in doing so, they create change and create innovation and create creativity sort of spares from there. And as a result, growth happens in the business and, and for yourself as well and for your teammates. So that's just an example. If we don't challenge the status quo, and we really live by this example that, you know, we have to be that right culture fit, we won't see any difference. 
And I think that's how I'd like to leave it. So I'll pass it to Sarah. Thanks, Alicia. Yeah, it's that kind of idea that, that sort of maintaining this culture fit idea is almost like perpetuating the status quo, isn't it? In some times rather than trying to, trying to challenge things. And um, I think that's really interesting. So we're going to throw it open to you now to have a little bit of interaction. So um, feel free to add your thoughts in the chat on this, um, you know, or, or unmute and, and say something if you'd like. Um, but I just wanted to hear about any ways that you had challenged the status quo in the past. And, and do you have any of your own maybe tips for ways you've done that or stories you could share? Um, and maybe while, sorry, I'm going to slightly spring this on your mark, but maybe while we're waiting, you, you, I don't know if you had an example, didn't you, recently that it's something that you'd... Um, I don't know if you wanted to share anything around that while we're sort yeah, of... Yeah, sorry, I couldn't get off mute then for a second. <laughs> um, so I, I work in recruitment and I come across it a hell of a lot where managers go, yeah, they were right. The, yeah, they had all the skills to do the job, but I just don't think they fit in with the team. And my response always back to that is, well, define what fitting in with the team actually is. And the amount of times they, they stop and go, oh, yeah, I don't really think now I can answer that. You must take the wind out of the sails at that point um, and just get them to really think about, well, what does it mean to sit in your team? And you, you do sometimes get as well, and I always say to, to people that I work with and, and the managers as well, that how many times have you sat at work and kind of looked around at all your colleagues and thought, I don't think I would have actually been friends with these people if I'd have met them outside of work. You wouldn't have gone out and selected some of the people that you potentially work with, but actually you get on with them fantastically well in the office and you, you kind of part there part and parcel just because you, you sat opposite each other for eight hours a day and you become friends and actually that that in itself is is challenging that status quo and your own little unconscious biases that you might have as to well what does it mean to fit in what's my culture and how do I fit in with it and how do I get people to fit in with that as well so it's, it's always quite interesting. That's great um has anybody else kind of used you know that the sort of asking why um you know, has anybody asked why we do something a certain way and, and sort of found that there wasn't really an answer? Um, Caroline put in the chat, kind of asking for diverse interview panels, I think that's a really good one. Challenging biases and seeking others and situations that are different to you is a really great way of challenging yourself, I think. Uh, Joe said, I've often challenged people their choices of candidates, they are in choosing to interview to encourage them to identify any biases that may be leading to them, sorry, them to not giving people opportunities is that's great thanks for that joe um i just wondered if um there's any you've got any examples of how you've done things in a slightly different way so how have you um maybe used humor to challenge something or have you tried challenging somebody in authority um or have you have you have you just challenged someone in public or in or have you or have you sort of tried to choose chose to do it in private uh i've got Catherine saying, I assumed it was because of my age, but they were not willing to exp explain the, the lack of fit. Yeah, and I think sometimes we uh, we, we kind of know that that means that they are, um, you know, probably not really thinking this through themselves. Um, that's great. Thanks for, thanks for those contributions. If you can, I have the last slide, please. So this is, again, this is just one for your reflection, really. Um, so I can, I'll leave you with this to think about um, and reflect on. If you have a, an answer that, for yourself that you want to put in the chat, that's great. But if not, then just keep that for yourself. So we're just going to ask you now, what thinking about the status quo, what will you do? What's the one thing you want to do differently that will challenge the status quo for you in the next week? And if you write that down and commit to it, that's great. If you share it in the chat, even better. Uh, and that's all from us. Back to you, Claire. Oh, sorry, I was just typing my contribution into the chat there and uh, missed my cue to unmute. <laughs> Thank you very much for that. And um, yeah, so important just to open up the conversation around challenging bias and challenging the status quo and, and asking those why so thank you for for drawing our attention to those um and if people do want to put some comments into there then um, we are going to have a section at the end um to share your story so please do keep sharing and and and, and passing your comments um right now we are going to hand over to joe penker who is going to be talking about I've completely forgotten, so I'll let her, <laughs> I'll let her introduce it. <laughs> Thanks, Joe. Hi, everybody. Um, so this section is a little bit more sensitive. Um, we're going to be talking about giving ourselves permission to ask for help. 
And um, we've broken this up into two sections, well-being in the workplace and support in our personal lives. So um, we're going to talk about in that section, help for women who seek support with therapy um, when they don't have the income to fund this themselves, help for victims of domestic abuse, signposting for people from a range of circumstances, apologies, in respect of help for mental health, well-being and abuse. And finally, a few really inspiring words on resilience. Before we go into this, there are a range of sensitive topics on here and I just want to, to warn you all before we go into it. So the first section on wellbeing in the workplace is less sensitive and then we go a bit deeper into some of these topics. So here we go. So firstly, I'd like to start with wellbeing in the workplace, permission to ask for help. Um, and I'm going to introduce to you Javid Babat. Uh, he is a finance recruiter and founder of FIDE. Um, he's going to discuss this concept in a bit more detail in the context of his own business model. The purpose of this is to demonstrate the shift of thought from simply having employees to considering their well-being and supporting them in the right way. I find his concept refreshing and something we can all consider taking um, and challenging the status quo on, <laughs> leading on from the DNI section. Uh, many employers have shifted their balance quite considerably in the last year, so um, I think there's still a lot to be done, but there's certainly progress being made. Javid, over to you. Thanks, Joe, and um, <clears throat> thanks to Claire and the team for having me for um, for this particular part of the of the session. Um, I guess, yeah, without going into too much more detail with Joe being given an introduction, but um, yeah, so my background is 20 years as a finance recruiter. Um, I left the corporate world um, because I had a sort of breakdown and I had to focus on my own mental health. And if you ever wanted a poster person as, as an example where money and success, does it lead to happiness? Then I would be a perfect example of where that wouldn't be the case. And more than happy to discuss that offline with anyone who'd be interested to understand a little bit more of that. <clears throat> I guess my unease and unhappiness was sort of brewing for quite a few years and a little bit at odds within my own industry because I felt that recruiters do get a bad rep and I think a lot of it is warranted, but I feel that <clears throat> as a recruiter, you're in a unique position where you can have the sounding board in the ear of employers and line managers across all manner of businesses of all shapes and sizes, but also individuals um, who work there. <clears throat> what I was increasingly finding that, um, especially when it came to mental health and well-being, that there was a, a disconnect that was on the rise for many, many years. And I was noticing for, for, for several years how stress, anxiety, depression, burnout, absenteeism, presenteeism within my sector and generally across the workplace had been on the rife for many, many years, but many em employees were feeling quite unsupported by their employers. And because of my sort of approach as a recruiter, I was having these sort of very quite difficult conversations with more and more people and realizing that there was either a tick box exercise done by employers um, or it was felt that it wasn't genuine and authentic enough. So in terms of where I'm at now and you know where I feel it is very positive that yes these instances are on the rise and, and COVID has done the world of mental health in the workplace a lot of favours it has amplified its importance for me and where I'd sort of be giving sort of a, one of my sort of encouragement to to everyone here today is how to give yourself permission to ask for help within the workplace and obviously what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to empower individuals I'm trying to empower teams I'm trying to um empower management teams as well by having conversations on a daily and weekly basis on how to bring the mental health conversation forward a lot more um, and really trying to be an external sounding board and sharing that knowledge insight and best practice um, if we could move on to the next couple of two slides um, i've gone through this which i know is sort of there um, I guess the bits I want to focus on, and um, I'll come to this, is um, there's two core sections, how to support yourself, but also um, how to support others. And the reason I wanted to start with how to support yourself is there's a huge amount of emphasis in any one-on-one -on -one conversation I have with anybody um, um, in the workplace at any level. I talk about the importance of self-care and how to prioritise your own sort of self-care and just picking up on what one of something that Claire said a few moments ago in her part 
um, that looking after yourself and your own well-being isn't selfish. I think there's, um, there's a heck of a lot of stress and strains in our lives, both in and out of work, and you must sort of uh, prioritise your sort of self-care and well-being over, over anything else. And um, some of you may have heard a saying, you can't pour from an empty cup. And that has definitely been felt a lot in the last sort of year by many people that I'm speaking with. So this is um, something that is on the Mental Health First Aid England website, which um, if none of you know who it is, I'm, I'm a Mental Health First Aid instructor and these are some of the resources that are available. Um, but a couple of these are resources that are available to you as well for you to have a look in your own time. Um, but yeah, really looking at how, you know, on a daily basis, how's your mental health? How are you looking after your well-being? Um, looking at the concept of a stress container, which again, I've not got time to go through, but it's a very good visual to help you sort of understand um, yourself more. Um, how's your thinking today? And then just your overall sort of mental health journey. I said that this could be a whole session on sort of self-care, but I just really want it to be more of a whistle stop tour. Um, but definitely go on to the Mental Health First Aid England website that can give you a bit more information. But I guess the main thing is just make sure you do prioritise your self-care before being in a position to support others. If we can move on to the next slide, please. So yeah, moving on to sort of signs to spot. Now, one of the things I say is that these are signs to either spot within yourselves or when you are looking at sort of spotting signs within others. Um, so yeah, th there's a heightened level of sort of just being a lot more sort of self-aware around sort of, um, sort of around yourself and changes in your sort of uh, sort of physical or emotional behaviours in order to um, recognise them a lot sooner than perhaps many of us do. Um, and if the more self-aware you become, the more then you're able to sort of correct and action them. And so many conversations I have where many have perhaps recognised the symptoms and either chosen to sort of ignore them or run away from them. Um, and it's more around just sort of the more you recognise them, the early intervention is very, very crucial. So um, think about when you're looking at science's part is, as you can see, there's physical, emotional, behavioural ones, there's visual cues, there's verbal and non-verbal cues actions and behaviours and um, when you are noticing patterns of change either within yourself or within others then that's the time where a either you need to give yourself permission or um, if it's someone you're concerned about whether that's in the workplace or someone that you know that you can then be in a position to perhaps sort of approach them and have a conversation with them in the right way but um yeah, well, whilst the signs will vary from individuals to individuals, this is some of the ones that you should look out for, um, you know, that are highlighted on this slide. So move on to the next slide, please. So I guess when you are in a position where you are to support others, so, and I know we are talking about permission to, to ask for help yourself, but if you do spot the signs and I think a lot of what we need to be aware of is we need to be looking out for each other and the last sort of 12 months in particular have really sort of almost amplified that importance as well we're not physically seeing people as much as we used to do um some of the cues we perhaps may not be able to see because we're not seeing people every day um but once we do come out at the other side and we're in a position to sort of you know meet people and even sort of on the phone i think just to make sure that um you are an, in a position to support them and one of the things that on the main point of this slide is how to listen and i don't know if many of you have sort of heard of the concept of active listening and in fact i think if you if you go on the samaritans website you can do a course on active listening but um it's really important when you are either seeking permission to ask for help or supporting someone else that you know you are listening to them and fully focusing on their sort of problems and challenges um accepting them as they are get on their wavelength as much as you can. Um, the ability to listen and communicate non-judgmentally non is really important when you're having conversations around mental health or an individual's mental health and well-being. Always be careful about um, your choice of words, your um, yours and their sort of tone and voice and body language because they're the sort of things they're going to be picking up on. Um, I think the override message is to make sure you're giving someone the full attention. If you are concerned about the mental health of somebody or um, someone's giving you their attention that, you know, um, that is sort of active listening on both sides. 
um, always sort of make sure that you keep the conversation going after one particular, you know, one conversation is rarely enough. It'll be a huge relief and um, for that an individual if you are there to support them, but um, be sure that you sort of give them sort of reassurance that there is sort of more support available um, and, you know, accurately signpost them as required. If you can move on to the final slide. I guess I wanted to end my bit of the particular presentation um, around the sort of theme of around giving yourself permission. I genuinely feel that there is some positive changes that are coming around mental health in the workplace um, and generally as a society as a whole. I think COVID has sort of helped with that, which is a, an unfortunate byproduct, but it's quite clear that instances of stress, anxiety and burnout, whilst we're on the rise for many years in the last sort of year, it has amplified a lot more. Um, but something that I'm really looking to keen to advocate and trying to get a message across in this conversation or the conversation is the tide is turning from it being an employer led approach to being an employee led approach. So this is where you as individuals immediately starting within your friendship circles, but also within the workplace to really make it a bit more of an employee led approach um, rather than it being employer led. Because I think what has been proven with an employer led approach is that it's proven to be not as effective. Um, there's criticism that it's a tick box exercise and it's not authentic enough. And some of the ways that you can do that um, in terms of the, the, some of the pointers here is um, be more open to talk about your own mental health and that will, will begin to reduce the stigma and that will encourage more people to open up. Now, I know that I've gone from very private um, to being very public on social media in the last 12 to 18 months. And I've noticed a significant difference that the more I've opened up, that the more it's encouraged other people within my sort of not just personal, but professional network to open up, you know, and I've had senior contacts, you know, all the way up to sort of um, finance threats level and business owners. And, and some of in some instances have been on tears on the phone to me um, sharing their problems. And that comes from the fact that it's encouraging them and empowering them to give them permission to open up because I've given them that encouragement to do so. Um, create an internal community support network for mental health and well-being. So again, don't just rely on an employer, but no matter who you are, what level you work at, just try and create a support network for yourself. You know, starting with just a very small group of one or two of you who are interested and passionate about mental health and well-being and look to sort of build it out from there. Obviously within there, collaborate with your employer just to make sure they are supportive. But I think the message is that rather than just relying on centrally coordinated efforts, but become an activist yourself to really sort of, um, you know, create an, an internal community. And that community promise it will grow if you just sort of spend the time and the consistency in doing it. Um, encourage your employers to keep sort of doing more and supporting your efforts on creating an open culture. Now, I appreciate this is, easier said than done but um yeah just something to sort of you know for you to think about that um if your employer is perhaps not as supportive is that the sort of employee you want to work for um and then finally just provide feedback to your manager employer and what you need from them um <clears throat> so yeah i know that for, for some this is something that um is hard because there are some employers that aren't there on that mental health journey but if that is the case, perhaps is a yeah, decision for you to make is your permission to perhaps not be there and, you know, perhaps look for an employer that is more supportive of men's health and well-being. And yeah, that's my bit, Joe. I'll, um, I'll pass you over. Thanks very much. Uh, could we have the next slide, please, Claire? There's a load of comments in the chat. So if Javid, if you want to uh, respond to the comments, uh, that'd be great if, if you can. Uh, so we're moving on to well-being in our personal lives, permission to ask for help. Oh, sorry, yeah. Oh, there we go. Uh, so I got in touch with a lady a week or so ago um, called Helen Wilson, who's the um, COO of uh, Women's Counselling and Therapy Service for Leeds, uh, which is a government funded organisation. Uh, they work with women who've experienced a range of traumatic experiences um, and I just wanted to sort of mention and create awareness of some of those today. 
Um, so they were, uh, they embrace a disrupted approach to um, therapy. So they appreciate that some of the people that they're working with have experienced uh, extreme uh, trauma, such as domestic abuse, sexual violence, childhood abuse, trafficking, and, and so on. Um, as I said, these are very delicate subjects to touch on today. Um, they offer one-to-one -one counselling and psychotherapy to people who don't have the money to pay for it themselves, which I think is absolutely fantastic. Uh, they also offer casework, uh, so people that have been through extreme trauma, um, and they work with people to coach them and signpost them to materials to help prepare them to be able to get help um, through psychotherapy and other, other resources. Um, they also work with a um, groups of people in uh, project type work um, that have been victims of very specific categories or demographies um, to try and uh, provide more specialist support for people such as um, young girls 16 plus um, and uh, women aged 50 plus. Um, there's also various other um, sort of um, more abstract types of approaches that they use such as drama therapy. Um, the service is in great demand, but is available via self-referral. Um, so the, there's a link to the website here and, and that'll be going out in the slides, but I just wanted to really signpost and, and we're hoping to do an event with them sometime later this year uh, that will drill down on some of these concepts a bit more. Um, could you uh, have the next slide, please, Claire? Oh. Excellent. Um, so you might have seen on our social media this week um, that we have uh, shared this post and if you haven't, uh, please feel free to go to our Instagram, it's on there. Um, the reason I thought this was extremely important and even for people that aren't on here today, if you know anyone that could need help in your community, in your network, in your family, uh, the government's doing a campaign called Ask for Annie and effectively if, if this sign is seen by anyone in a local pharmacy they can go in and ask for Annie and they will be um, given access to a private room uh, and a phone and um, ways to contact people to, to offer help so I just wanted to flag that and ask you know anyone on this call today you know you could save someone's life please do feel free to share you know reshare that post. Uh, next slide please. Um, so finally, you know, if you know someone that is a victim, it can be hard, especially if you're a friend and family member. Um, you know, if you report it, you know, there's there's ways of reporting it. Make sure that you, you know, consider all the implications of that. But it is an important thing to be considering. If you're personally in immediate danger, call 999. You don't have to speak. They'll ask questions and you can respond by coughing or tapping the handset. I know that this is obviously not going to apply to a lot of people, but, you know, even if there's one person this helps today, then so be it. Uh, could we have the next slide, please? Okay, so the reason we're talking about all this today, uh, and I found these, these things quite powerful when I was, I was looking at the content for this event. Um, during the first lockdown, one-fifth or 20% of all police incidents involved domestic abuse, which has been a 5% rise in previous years compared to previous years. Uh, Refuge estimates as many as 50 women were murdered by someone that they live with in the first lockdown and more than 40,000 calls um, were made to the D National Domestic Abuse Helpline in the first period of lockdown and that wasn't a long period of time. Next slide please. So what I've done, I've pulled together a load of materials and like I say these will be made available to you after the event um, and it covers a whole range of topics we've been discussing today. So firstly the Leeds Mental Health Wellbeing Service, I won't touch on these very long because I'm very short on time and I'm conscious of that. Um, you can self-refer for that and they offer CBT therapies. Um, Mindwell, they offer loads of signposting to a whole range of anxiety, stress-related type charity um, type charities and organisations. Um, there's the NHS app, it's all NHS approved apps that can help with mental health well-being, anxiety, stress, mental health, um, any, any victims that have been through any of the experiences that we've talked about today. Um, could you go on to the next slide please Claire? Um, and again, there's another whole list here. Um, you know, I've picked out some a, a range of things that could affect a variety of people on this call. Um, just to call out a few, um, obviously there's the rape crisis organisation, very important one. 
um, and there's uh, Gallup, which helps with people who are uh, LGBTQ+. Um, there is, um, this is more related to people that have experienced um, violence, um, ha have felt suicidal, you know, have had really bad experiences and need support. And there's also forums on there. There's news about what's going on, you know, in relation to helping people to be protected. Could I have an next slide, please? So finally on this topic, um, we want to share some inspiring words on resilience by a lady called Lucy Hone. Uh, I want to warn you, this video briefly touches on a powerful and personal emotional message that the speaker's experienced about parental loss. Lucy is a resilience expert and she thought she found her calling by supporting people in um, Christchurch after the earthquake in 2011 that killed uh, 185 people. Um, however, that was uh, the first stage in her journey because she subsequently um, had an extreme tragedy when she lost her young daughter, her daughter's friend and one of her closest friends uh, through a car accident. And what she found was that some of the things that she was sharing weren't um, necessarily the advice she wanted to hear and it made her rethink everything. So what I want to share with you is what she devised as three strategies for resilience that help her got through life and that can be applied to many settings in life. So let's hope this works. Just a second. Let me know if you can hear it. <laughs> Three strategies. These are my go-to strategies that I relied upon and saved me in my darkest days. They're three strategies that underpin all of my work and they're pretty readily available to us all. Anyone can learn them. You can learn them right here today. So number one, resilient people get that shit happens. They know that suffering is part of life. This doesn't mean they actually welcome it in, they're not actually delusional, just that when the tough times come, they seem to know that suffering is part of every human existence. And knowing this stops you from feeling discriminated against when the tough times come. Never once did I find myself thinking, why me? In fact, I remember thinking, why not me? Terrible things happen to you just like they do everybody else. That's your life now, time to sink or swim. The real tragedy is that not enough of us seem to know this any longer. We seem to live in an age where we're entitled to a perfect life, where shiny happy photos on Instagram are the norm, when actually, as you all demonstrated at the start of my talk, the very opposite is true. Number two, resilient people are really good at choosing carefully where they select their attention. They have a habit of realistically appraising situations and typically managing to focus on the things that they can change and somehow accept the things that they can't. This is a vital, learnable skill. Everything in life is a negotiation. When you cross the street is a negotiation. Getting your coffee at Starbucks is a negotiation. You're probably in three to seven negotiations every single day. Your life can be in a completely different place just by improving how you negotiate. Negotiators are work Excellent. So that worked. <laughs> So you got part of it. I shall read the last one to you for fear of going wrong again, if I can find it, because I wrote it down as a backup plan. Just a minute. The third one was resilient people ask themselves, is what I'm doing helping me or harming me? And the final thing I wanted to say today is thank you for bearing with me through some very serious topics and some sensitive information. We hope you found this insightful, helpful, and hope it's given you some uh, really good material for reflection. Amazing. Thank you, Joe. Um, yeah, I won't say too much on that.
uh, too much more on that. But yeah, thanks. And I, I really hope if anyone needs to hear that, then, then we've helped somebody tonight at least. Um, okay, so we are going to move on to the next section now. Um, we have got collaborate and lift each other up. Um, and I'm going to hand over to Claire Ramsey, who is going to be sharing some of the comments. And we would love you to get involved in this bit. Let us know your comments. Let us know your thoughts. Let us know your questions. And um, yeah, let's let's hear what you give yourselves permission to do. Thanks, Claire. OK, I think for this one, I'm going to um, we've heard some really great examples even throughout tonight about what we're giving ourselves permission to do. And I think what we'd really like to do is get your input here at this part of the session, uh, whether you're quite willing to kind of speak up and share your examples or whether you want to kind of throw them into the chat about what you would like to give permission to yourself uh, to do moving forward. Um, and to give you a little bit of time, I will share my example and then hopefully give you uh, some time to think about what you're going to do or share. So I guess tonight um, or on the screen there, you'll see we've got members of the Lean and Leads Committee um, who have each kind of mocked up a uh, permission slip, so to speak. Um, and you'll see on there, mine is the one that was uh, hijacked, shall we say, by my daughter and dog Henna's. Um, and, and I guess quite apt really in terms of what my example was. So my example is that I need to give myself permission to, or I do give myself permission uh, to take time out to play and focus on family. And I guess, what I noticed when actually all these ones were being brought together is there are a lot of these examples that are really relevant to current time um, and what's happening for everyone at the moment. And that's exactly the same for mine. Um, so I guess it certainly influenced my example, um, but I chose my example because it's something I've had to work really hard on in the last year. Um, and I'll be really honest and say I started lockdown 1.0 um, in the same way I would probably start a project and my aim for, for this project uh, was to stay just as professional in my home as what I was doing uh, in work prior to lockdown. Now for anyone that shares their home with a partner, two children and an extremely needy dog uh, you will know that that lasted approximately one and a half days. And I very quickly realised that I was going to have to adjust my standards. Um, so I guess in all seriousness, fast forward a year for me, and I still have to work hard uh, to focus on, on family. And it's not so much focusing on the family that's the difficult bit, it's probably the easiest part of it. Um, it's not feeling guilty. Uh, to put down the email, to interrupt in the middle of a meeting, to do a bit of dinosaur homework or to tell your dog off. Um, and, and I think that's something that, that I guess is, is kind of the bit for me where I've kind of brought my example together. So I guess just reflecting on that, that's me. Um, but we really kind of want to hear from you now. Um, and I don't know whether you can throw things in the chat or if anybody kind of wants to, to really kind of shout out at this point and share some of their thoughts, either on what their example would be, what they're going to give themselves permission to do moving forward, um, or even just some thoughts on the topic. And I'm hoping this is not going to be a tumbleweed moment. So I can see we've got some in the chat. I give myself permission to spend time doing something that is just for me. Uh, say no sometimes. I uh, absolutely agree with that one. Um, to stay away from my desk and screens, yeah. I think we've seen quite a few on this one about taking time out, um, being present, turning off uh, kind of devices. I'm going to start calling on committee members to jump in now. So mine is I give myself permission to take a break and I can see it's a common theme in here. 
Uh, and the reason is, is because I never take a break. And uh, I've been actually getting some coaching through the uh, Lean and Mentoring program through an absolutely fantastic lady. And uh, she's uh, suggested to me to create a diary of what my perfect week looks like. Uh, so for me, permission to take a break is going to be creating that and actually trying to stick to it, which is going to be the first time in 20 years. <laughs> Thanks, Jill. Anyone else? I think um, just one from me. It's not one that I did share, but it's one that I'm starting to accept. I think many, many times I've always been told if you cry, you're seen as weak, but sometimes giving actually all the time, if I want to cry and I give myself permission to cry, I'm not weak. I'm just having my way of dealing with the situation. And I think that's okay. And that's what I've learned today through everybody's talking and presenting and sharing. So thank you. Um, so I'm pretty good at giving myself permission for most things and always have done um, and dance to my own drum but I've started work again this year and the one thing that I have given myself permission for is it's actually it's not just about people so I have a very old cat and his name is Batman and I have given myself permission for him to join all of my zoom calls with my colleagues <laughs> um, and, and just kind of show a bit more of the homely human side of me and I think a year ago I probably wouldn't have done that. I think that's my best or favourite example so far, Steph. And the best cat name I've ever heard. Okay, we've got some more coming through on the chat. <laughs> my ex-husband did. did. <laughs> and, <laughs> so I'm going to disprove what I'm about to say, but I'm going to give myself permission not to volunteer for things, not to be the one in the tumbleweed moment in the meeting where someone's looking for a volunteer for something to crack and say, yeah, I'll do it, I'll do it. So I'm going to stay quiet in those moments and uh, not overcommit to things. I think that's a great one, Caroline. And thank you for uh, sharing that. And I guess breaking it for a moment there for us. Anyone else? I see quite a lot coming through. Uh, definitely some agreement, Caroline, on that one. Uh, I like this one, giving myself permission to eat pizza with zero guilt. I think someone had the same night as I did yesterday. <laughs> Do you know, I just found myself yesterday. Yeah, I had a really shitty day. And at the end of the day, all I wanted was pizza, but I was supposed to be having noodles. And it was like healthy stir fry noodles. And I was like, no. And I had a massive takeaway pizza. I ate it all and it was fabulous. It was, why? Why would I be guilty about something that makes me feel so good? Eat the pizza. <laughs> We've got a lot of love for that one, Susie. I think. <laughs> Everyone's in agreement. I can see that Domino's are going to get a lot of calls as soon as we finish this. <laughs> She'd have a pizza party for the next one. <laughs> I think Claire's had in there. Good, hashtag. Good, really. <laughs> <laughs> Any more from anyone? I'll go if that's all right, Claire. Yeah, she. Uh, mine was I give myself permission to only surround myself with people who light me up and I think if this past year has taught me anything it's that I love my little family I love my chosen tribe and everyone else can sod off <laughs> life's too short to um I just waste time with dickheads you know <laughs> <laughs> Um, some of my in-laws. Well, <laughs> I don't want to say it. <laughs> <laughs> I have. Because I've started setting boundaries, which I think somebody put further up, really setting my stall up and just being like, this is my life and I cannot be arsed, quite frankly, with, you know, following other people's tune. It's too so, precious. It's too yeah. short. It's too precious. We've got a uh, 100% for that one, Claire. <laughs> <laughs> Nicely put. <laughs> LOL. And, uh, and amen. I think there must be quite a lot of people feeling that at the moment. Any more for any more? Well, 
I think we've got a lot of great examples coming through there. I keep putting them in. Um, I definitely think that is a wrap, Joe. I'm just trying to see, actually. So, uh, Claire, I don't know if we've got Nikki on yet. Is Nikki Green there? We are waiting for our yoga teacher. I oh dare. Is Claire going to be teaching us yoga moves instead, huh? <laughs> Shall I do a permission one to fill in the time? Yeah. <laughs> do a contribution. <laughs> I was just thinking when when you kind of launched that the campaign around, I give myself permission. I actually felt like, like it really resonated with me when just just the whole permission thing because I I've definitely felt and I think I've been told in the past that I sometimes if I have an idea about something or something I want to do I sometimes like especially at work wait for permission or almost ask, wait for someone to give me permission to do it and so I actually think the whole I just give I give myself permission full stop is is a great thing for me to remember it's just I don't have to wait for anyone to tell me to do this if I have an idea I'm just gonna I'm just gonna do it so that was that was my one. I think Sarah that's those few words are actually quite empowering and I'm starting to sort of use that now as part of my post-it notes I'm going to sort of have that and I sent a video to some of our some of the ladies on this and and colleagues on the steering committee um which is a video um which talks about you know you are a queen you are amazing and it's such an empowering video which I want to share so hopefully I'll find it and pop it in the chat and I recommend every person on this call to listen to it because it really is like they are talking to you and you've got this is pretty much why I ended with. So I'll just try and find it if I can and share it. It is great. I have, yeah. <laughs> okay, I'm looking down the list, Claire, and I can't see Nikki there. Yeah. Um, I think she had some challenges with children, didn't she? She had quite quite a tight bedtime. Was it was it Claire to to contend with? So I wonder if anything's gone awry there. Um, so I think we're going to have to assume that we've lost our yoga teacher, unfortunately. Um, so let's all pretend that we've had a shavasana. <laughs> <laughs> Namaste. <laughs> Um, and we've all got a nice picture of Nikki there, so we can imagine what it would have been like. And we'll hope this uh, class has given ourselves permission to adapt. We are giving ourselves permission <laughs> to think on our feet. Oh Wing God. it. We are all winging it. If that's something else that I've found out this year. Um, yes, absolutely. So let's send Nikki best wishes and hope she is OK wherever she is in the world and hope she's all right and hopefully join us for um another event soon but let's 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 wrap up so okay we have covered a lot this evening it's been emotional it's been a bit of a roller coaster we've had highs we've had lows we've had stories we've had honesty i mean geez thank you so much for being here and being present and being honest and sharing your stories because it honestly it is absolutely an honor to, to to be part of this group it's phenomenal it really really is and my challenge and my invitation to you is to go forward implement these ideas challenge um and give yourself permission to to to, to live you know to, to to just make these changes and live life on your terms and just be wonderful um we are going to be sharing all the resources that we've spoken about this evening i know we've covered a lot so uh, don't worry we'll get those to you if you want to to find somebody or follow up or whatever um and please let us know if we have touched upon a topic you would like like us to cover in more depth um we want to be reflective of the community if there is an appetite to hear more about something or discuss something in in greater depth then we, we would love to be able to, to to offer that to our lovely lean and leads community um if you have not already, please make sure you've signed up to leanin.org. That's the way you get on our mailing list and find out about all our events. We've got breakfast club events every month. We've got evening events like this every month. And um, we've got a snazzy new um, mailing system as well. So that'll be exciting to watch out for. Um, and I think that is it. So I hope you have enjoyed it. Thank you so much for your time, your attention and the, the honour of your presence. And I see you all next time. <laughs>